Good morning. I'm Pastor Brian here at Richfield Lutheran Church in South Minneapolis. With us today are MB as assisting minister, Paul is on the organ, and Mary is our vocalist. Today is the 20th Sunday after Pentecost. Our gospel today is Matthew chapter 22, verses 15 through 22. When the Pharisees try to trap Jesus, he tells them to give the emperor what belongs to him and to God what belongs to God. Together for Worship reminds us that our ultimate allegiance is to God rather than to any earthly authority. Created in the image of God, we offer our entire selves in the service of God and for the sake of the world. Today we celebrate communion. You are invited to receive. Please have bread and juice or something comparable ready. Our prelude is Beautiful Savior by Schroeder. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Our gathering hymn is God is here. God 
as we, your people, meet to offer praise and prayer, may we find in fuller measure what it is in Christ we share. Here as in the world around us, all our varied skills and arts wait the coming of the Spirit into open minds and hearts. Lord of all, of church and kingdom, in an age of change and doubt, keep us faithful to the gospel, help us work your purpose out, here in this day's dedication. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And, and also, also with you. you. Let us pray. Sovereign, Sovereign God, God, raise your, your throne in our, our hearts. Created, created by you, let us, us live in your image. image. Created for you, let us act for your glory. Redeemed by you, let us give you what is yours. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Our gospel is Matthew chapter 22, verses 15 through 22. After Jesus begins teaching in the temple, religious leaders try to trap him with questions. First, they ask if God's people should pay taxes to an earthly tyrant like Caesar. This is the Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the 22nd chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Then the Pharisees went and plotted to entrap Jesus in what he said. So they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are sincere and teach the way of God in accordance with truth and show deference to no one, for you do not regard people with partiality. Tell us then, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why are you putting me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. Then he said to them, Whose head is this, and whose title? They answered, The emperor's. Then he said to them, Give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard this, they were amazed, and they left him and went away. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. How do other people know what belongs to you? I mean, if someone were to steal your bicycle or your television, how would the police know who to return it to if they recovered it? Many police departments encourage us to participate in something they call Operation Identification. They give us a unique number to mark on our valuables. So then police departments all over can look that number up if the stolen item is recovered, and then they know who the property belongs to. A close and personal friend of mine does that with a vengeance. He marks all of his stuff with his operation identification number. And ha, he writes his initials on everything with a permanent marker. Well, I mean, that makes sense. I mean, because I don't have access to the police computers with all those operation identification numbers. But I do know his initials. And I know that when I see something marked RHB, huh, I know that it belongs to my friend Robert. 
I don't think he does this because he's paranoid or miserly. I mean, he does this because he's a great guy who just regularly lends out his stuff to his friends, and he'd like it back. Certainly, he's like, he's like, a, like a giant lending library of tools and, and sporting equipment and books and such. But I wonder if he's a little obsessive about it. I mean, there is a line, isn't there? I mean, it seems everything is marked with his initials. I joke, I, I wonder if, he, if he's marked his wife and their daughter with his initials. Uh. So what belongs to whom was a big deal 2,000 years ago, too? And taxes were a big deal then as well. Taxes were just as unpopular then as they are today. I mean, it's my money after all, and I've worked hard for my money. I want to keep it. I want to provide for my family, you know. In Jesus' time, Israel was not an independent nation, but was a vassal state of the Roman Empire, as was almost all of the known world. As far as empires go, Rome wasn't too bad. Unlike the previous empires of Babylon and Assyria, who exiled everyone to conquered countries as slaves, no, on the whole, Rome was content to let you stay in your own country, to speak your own language, to keep your culture and your religion. All they asked in exchange was for you to be peaceful and not upset the system, because the system kept the goods and services flowing throughout the empire, and the profits and taxes flowing to Rome. Now, yeah, on the whole, it was a peaceful time for the world, and the Roman army made sure of that. But all this cost money. So Rome taxed the people for the cost of keeping the peace. And peace is good for business. But to be a vassal state of a foreign nation is still an insult. And to have to pay taxes just rubs salt into the wound. The Jewish people were divided on this. Now, those who were Pharisees, they wanted the Romans out. They longed for the good old days under King David when, when Israel was a nation to be reckoned with. And then there were those who were the Herodians. And I think they were realistic. They were content to trade off self-rule in exchange for peace and good business. But this was more than just politics. After all, God was clear in the Old Testament that he is the only one and true God. And don't you forget it. And that's where the rubber hit the road for the Pharisees. Because you see, integral to the Roman system that maintained peace worldwide was that Caesar, the Roman emperor, claimed his power to rule over the world was because he was a god. Well, and if one guy can rule the entire known world, well, that's hard to argue with. And so that's what the coins said. They had Caesar's picture on them, as well as an inscription saying he was God. So anytime you did business, you were reminded of Caesar's power and his divine claims. But God, God with a capital G, the God of the Bible, says there's only one God, and it's him. And don't you forget it. So we have a problem here. Can the people of God be faithful and worship the one true God and observe the civic obligations that Rome demanded as part of allegiance. Doesn't this seem like a either-or situation, Jesus? And that's what the Pharisees and the Herodians wanted to know. They wanted a black or white answer, an answer that would settle this issue, no more, no more fence-sitting. It's time to fish or cut bait. Of course, such a Clear-cut answer is guaranteed to get Jesus in trouble with half the people. Hmm. Would Jesus take the Pharisees' position that to pledge allegiance to the nation would violate our faith to the one true God, and thus we shouldn't pay taxes? Well, that'd make him very popular with a lot of people, but it'd also get him in hot water with Rome for treason and rebellion. But if Jesus took the Herodians' position and said, sure, we could pay taxes. Well, he would be supporting the status quo with Caesar and Rome. No man is an island. We are interconnected and interdependent. You have to use money in some form to get anything done. And you have to pay taxes, whether you like what you pay taxes for 
or not. And yet the Pharisees' question haunts us. Can we be faithful to God and still pledge our allegiance to a nation that is run by humans? I mean, isn't that contradictory? I mean, God doesn't say to put him first among many demands in life. Rather, God says he is the one and only thing in our life, demanding our total, absolute, and ultimate allegiance. So yeah, what is the answer, Jesus? Jesus answers this question all right, but he does so by saying that we are asking the wrong question. Jesus says that a lot. It seems we ask the wrong question a lot of the time. What Jesus does is he reframes our question. He, he puts it in a different light. He looks at it from a different perspective. Because when we have our mind set on human things, we cannot see the world from a divine point of view. All right, let me ask you a few questions that I bet you can answer, okay? Did you get dressed this morning or... Do you have a car? Do you eat cereal for breakfast? Or don't you like football? Are you a Christian? Or do you live in America? Will you obey God? Or will you pay taxes? Now, these are what we call false dichotomies, things that are wrongly set against each other, things that that, that are either ors that really aren't either or. I mean, can you wear clothes and drive a car? I mean, can you eat cereal and enjoy a football? Can you be a Christian and live in America? Well, of course. You can be an American Christian who wears clothes and eats cereal while enjoying football after you've driven a car. I mean, these things are not mutually exclusive. So beware of someone who asks questions like this because there's probably some agenda behind it. And at the same time, rejoice, because such scheming is no match for the crucified and risen Christ. Jesus says, go ahead, pay the taxes. I mean, those coins already belong to Caesar. They have his, his picture on them. That's his brand. When most people could not read or write, as back then, Writing your name and title on something, it, it just isn't enough. I mean, you've got to mark it with something that everyone can recognize. In this case, Caesar's image. Huh. Sort of like my friend who marks his valuables with both his operation identification number for the police to look up and his initials for everyone else to recognize that, hey, this here belongs to Robert and don't you forget it. Jesus says, go ahead and pay taxes. I mean, that money is all an essential part of the system that is this world. I bet those Pharisees gasped when they heard that. And Jesus continued saying, And give to God those things that are God's. In other words, this isn't some either-or question. There's more here than meets the eye. The world is not divided into either sacred or secular. It's not black and white at all. Jesus says, Give to the government those things that belong to human ways. And give to God those things that belong to God. Okay, Jesus, we get it. I mean, those things that belong to the government are marked, those things are marked as theirs. Now, in those days, that meant marked with Caesar's mark, his, his name, his title, or his image, like on these coins. But what belongs to God? And how does God mark stuff with his initials? What does this mark look like? In Genesis chapter 1, the first chapter of the first book of the Bible, we hear that humankind was made in the image of God. Okay? That is that we are the image of God. <laughs> you and me, all of us, we are the image of God. And if you want to know what God looks like, <laughs> just look around or look in a mirror. We are the image of God who we are, we ourselves, us, you and me. We are the very mark of God. Now, while everything belongs to God, since God created everything, well, he went to a special effort to make us in God's image. We are that important, that special, that, that precious. And so we belong to God. We are God's. 
So as Jesus says here, give to the government the things that belong to the government and give to God that which belongs to God, namely us, you and me. Now, at church, we balk whenever we talk about stewardship. I mean, yeah, we know that God is counting on the fruits of our labor to provide for God's mission and ministry throughout the world, and that which God asks to bless the world is 10% of our harvest, our income. And we do have to use the coin of the realm to pay our stewardship. It's just how the world runs, how we pay staff, how we pay the heat bill, how we make sure food and clothing are sent where they need to be. I mean, the world and God's possessions are interconnected. But 10% seems a lot, some people say, just just unreasonable and unrealistic. (laughs) Now Jesus comes along and says that God wants everything. 100%, not not just 10%, but the whole shooting match, huh? God is like my friend who marks his valuables with both his operational identification number for the police to look up and his initials for all of us to recognize that, hey, this belongs to Robert and don't you forget it. And it's like us, human beings, we are marked with our unique operation identification numbers. Well, I suppose that'd be our DNA. But that's impossible to make sense out of without the right equipment. So we are also marked, we are marked with a watery cross on our foreheads. In your baptism, you were branded. The pastor dipped his or her thumb in the water or the font, and made the sign of the cross on your forehead saying, Child of God, remember, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit and marked with the cross of Christ forever. You are God's. And nothing you say or do, or don't say or do, can change that. It's like the Apostle Paul says in Romans 8, nothing, nothing, nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Nothing. God has claimed you forever. Whether you can see it or not, whether someone else recognizes it or not, whether you like it or not. I suppose that can feel onerous. Or I think that can feel like the greatest thing in the world, that you are a beloved child of God himself, and nothing can change that. Maybe it feels like both from one time to another. You belong to God. You. Now, what do you want to do in light of all this? Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Our hymn of the day is Lift Every Voice and Sing. Stray 
from the places our God where we met thee. Lest our hearts, drunk with the wine of the world, we forget thee. Shadowed beneath thy hand, may we forever stand true to our God, true to our name. At this time, we ask that you continue to share your tithe and offerings for God's mission and ministry through Richfield Lutheran Church. As we move into Holy Communion, if you need to pause the video at this point and get your bread and juice or whatever ready, come to the table. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, Broke it. Give it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this as you remember me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as you remember me. For as often as we eat of this bread, and drink of this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ, Christ has died, Christ, Christ is risen, risen. Christ, Christ will come again. again. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our, our Father, Father in heaven, heaven, hallowed be your name. Your, your kingdom come, your will, will be done, on earth, earth as in heaven. heaven. Give, Give us today our daily bread. bread. Forgive us our sins, sins as we forgive, forgive those, those who sin against us. us. Save, Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from the evil. For the kingdom, kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Come to the banquet table where Christ gives himself as food and drink. The body of Christ given for you, the blood of Christ shed for you. The body of Christ given for you. Blood of Christ shed for you. The body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in His grace. Amen. Join us here next week when our gospel reading will be Matthew chapter 22, verses 34 through 46. Put on the spot by the Pharisees. Jesus displays wisdom by summarizing the law of God in just two commandments, and by demonstrating that the Messiah must be more than the son of David. Until then, go forth with God's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Our sending him is you servants of God.
Go in peace. Share the good news. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Our postlude today is Fugue in G Minor by Bach. <laughs> 